I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, television game Jeopardy. It's an answer in search of a question. So if the answer was the current president of the United States, the question would be, who is Barack Obama? Okay, so how about uh, this answer? A long, tiresome speech delivered by a frothy pie topping. There's probably a few thousand people here, and nobody, nobody's got that. It's obviously a meringue. What is a meringue harangue? Uh, so Watson, the, uh, that computer actually lives near here, um, got that correct in its televised uh, competition against the best two Jeopardy players in the world. And Watson got a higher score than those two players combined. And I'll want to touch on the significance of it, but it's, it addresses the issue of whether the progress we're making, the exponential progress, is just in hardware, because that's one of the criticisms that comes up. Oh, Kurzweil's right. Yeah, hardware has been progressing exponentially, but software is stuck in the mud. There's different ways to approach that, but uh, just uh, in terms of qualitative visceral reactions, uh, Watson is very impressive because it's dealing with the subtleties and vagaries of human language. Uh, I made a prediction in the early 80s that a computer would take the World Chess Championship by 98, and I also predicted that when that happened, we would immediately dismiss chess as of being uh, of any significance. <laughs> and both of those things happened in 97. Kas uh, Kasparov was defeated by Deep Blue, and people immediately said, well, that's to be expected. Chess is a logic game, and computers are logic machines, and so obviously computers will ultimately do a better job. Uh, computers will never be able to master the subtleties uh, and vagaries of human language, metaphors, puns, similes, riddles, jokes. Well, that's exactly what Jeopardy is all about. That's one reason this is very significant. Now, some people uh, misunderstand the nature of Watson. They think that all of its knowledge was hand-coded by the scientists. Okay, it does have to deal with the subtle language in these Jeopardy queries, which, which have metaphors and are you know, pretty tricky examples of human language. But it got its knowledge about to come up with the correct response, not by being hand-coded, but by actually sitting down, figuratively, and reading uh, it was actually 200 million pages of natural language documents, including all of Wikipedia. So, and it was able to master all that, remember it all. They're not orderly facts. I mean, if you read a Wikipedia article, it's all kinds of information presented in a hierarchical, ambiguous fashion. And it has mastered that enough to actually respond to the questions correctly and can call up any fact from those 200 million pages in three seconds. So it's, it's quite impressive. Well, very quickly, uh, this was the first exponential graph I came up with in, in the early 1980s, 81. I was looking for a way to predict technology because the key to being successful as an inventor and an entrepreneur, or really pretty much anything in life, whether you're pursuing a career or a romance, is timing. So I wanted to see if I could anticipate where technology will be. It made a surprising discovery. If you measure the basic fundamental measures of information technology, uh, any information technology, they, they follow very predictable trajectories, belying the common wisdom that you can't predict the future. So I had this graph up through 1980 and 81. Uh, by the way, this is a logarithmic scale, so every level on this graph is 100,000 times greater than the level below it. So even through 1980, this represented trillions-fold increase since the 1890 American census. Uh, as of today, it's a billion, several billion times uh, pro of uh, progress since I was a student. But look at how smooth a trajectory that is. One of the criticisms, oh, well, exponential growth can't go on forever. Uh, that's true for specific paradigms. So there were shrinking vacuum tubes in the 1950s. Finally, that came to an end. They couldn't do that anymore. It just went on to another paradigm, transistors, and then ships and Moore's Law. And Moore's Law will come to an end around 2020. We'll go on to the sixth paradigm of three-dimensional computing. But the remarkable thing here is, look at how smooth and predictable a trajectory this is. I actually plotted that curve in 1981 through 2050. And as of now, you know, 
around 2012, we're very much on that trajectory that I plotted 30 years ago. So this has been very predictive. Uh, here's a graph that was in uh, Lev Grossman's cover story uh, on the singularity, and which is basically uh, the outgrowth of the law of accelerating returns. And uh, this has been a very predictive phenomenon. It's not just computers. On the right, there is the uh, trajectory of the number of bits we move around wirelessly in the world. So a century ago, that was Morse code over AM radio. Today, it's 4G networks. Uh, again, that's trillions-fold increase. Every level on that graph is 1,000 times greater than the level below it. Uh, but look at how smooth the trajectory that is, uh, which is surprising when you consider all the news and events that come out of you know, new auctions of spectrum and multi-billion dollar companies going bankrupt. You, not to mention World War I and World War II and the Cold War and the Great Depression. You'd think this would be a very unpredictable phenomena, but it's amazing how smooth it is. A very important area is biology, health and medicine, which was not an information technology up until just recently. Uh, but now that we've collected the genome, uh, this has become an information technology. And that, that by the way, was a, a very good example of exponential growth. Halfway through the project, the skeptics were going strong, saying, I told you this wasn't going to work. You're seven years into this 15-year project, you finished 1% of the project. Seven years, 1%, it's going to take 700 years, like we said. My reaction was, no, we're almost done. Uh, once you hit 1%, you're only seven doublings from 100%. It continued to double every year. It was done a year ahead of schedule. And every other aspect of biology is scaling up exponentially. Maybe we'll get into more discussion about that. But how long do you go without updating the software on your devices. This is probably updating itself now as I speak. But we're walking around with outdated software in our bodies, and it's not a metaphor. We have 23,000 little software programs called genes. They're not written in C++. I think they're written in COBOL. <laughs> uh, but what, one of those little programs says, hold on to every calorie, because the next hunting season may not work out so well. That's the fat insulin receptor gene. That was turned off in animal experiments. And these animals ate ravenously and remained slim and tw lived 20% longer. And they're working with Johnson Diabetes Centers, working with a drug company on that. Uh, that's just one of the 23,000 genes we'd like to consider changing. There's a lot going on with stem cells. Uh, we can get into more of that. But the point is that health and medicine is now an information technology. Therefore, it will be subject to this law of accelerating returns. It's approximately doubling in power and capability and bandwidth and price performance every year. Therefore, these technologies will be a thousand times more powerful in 10 years, a million times more powerful in 20 years, and it will be a very different era.